There was a time not so long ago when institutions were considered convenient places to send mentally and physically disabled people. Once there, they were out of sight, out of mind. Yesterday, that was the conventional wisdom. Hide the handicapped in places like this or in a back room at home. Pretend they were never born. Disabled people were often treated as if they weren't human beings, just disempowered bodies without minds, feelings, or emotions. Ruth Senkowitz knows, for 16 years in an institution, Ruth experienced a nightmare most of us can't even begin to imagine. A bright and lucid mind trapped in a lifeless, voiceless body. Born in 1950, Ruth was a healthy child until the age of five weeks, when she was stricken with encephalitis. The high fever damaged her central nervous system, leaving her with severe cerebral palsy. Since that time, Ruth has been unable to speak. She can barely move more than her eyes and her lips and cannot care for herself in any way. This is the house in Springfield, Massachusetts, where Ruth spent most of her childhood. She had a happy life here, full of love and affection. This recreation of Ruth's autobiography takes place in the actual bedroom she shared with her little sister, Shari, who was able to understand Ruth's closed world. Uh, Do you want me to get mommy so you can go potty? Uh, Is it Gretel? Does Gretel need a bath? Uh, While Ruth was adjusting to her limitations the best she knew how, caring for her was becoming too much of an emotional and financial burden for the family. But when they started looking for a way to ease the strain, they discovered there was none. None, that is, except for the state school at Belchertown, an institution for the mentally retarded. I just don't want my daughter in that place. You know they are better able to take care of her than we are. Look, we'll try harder. We can all try a little bit harder, just a bit. Father kept saying that it was the best thing for the family. When I heard them arguing about this, I wanted to run away. Made up my mind. So on May 14th, 1962, just a few months shy of her 12th birthday, Ruth was sent here to Belchertown. Since Belchertown officially admitted only the mentally retarded, Ruth's parents, like many other parents of physically disabled people, had to stipulate that she was also retarded, a fact Ruth recalls her parents neglected to tell her about. Tonight, using Ruth's own thoughts and another's voice, we've recreated her horrifying story of life behind these walls. The scenes are graphic. Ruth was with us during the filming and verified that what we are about to show you really happened. Okay, let's, let me see what kind of shape you're I was taken into an office and examined by a man. He spoke English with a heavy accent. Okay, Ruth, now we're going to move your, your head a little. He undressed me and slapped me into diapers. Many years later, I learned that this brief examination also included a psychological evaluation. Obviously, no comprehension. In that evaluation, Dr. Soon concluded that since I didn't talk and apparently couldn't understand what he was saying, I must be an imbecile. And so from that moment on, she was treated like one. Overnight, her life became a living hell. They talked disparagingly about me right to my face, as if I couldn't understand a word they were saying. The attendant shoved gobs of food into my mouth and expected me to swallow them in big gulps while I was flat on my back. I made hundreds of sounds and facial expressions in the hope of generating a response, any response, but they continued to ignore me. As long as these people considered my brain useless and my facial expressions and sounds meaningless, I was doomed to remain voiceless. This was as progressive a place as a medieval madhouse. The infirmary was, in many ways, the institution's chamber of horrors. Uh, 
And it was here in the infirmary or the chamber of horrors that Ruth would spend the next 13 years of her life, much of it flat on her back. Her wheelchair leg and back braces, which she had used at home and had supported her limbs, were abruptly taken away. The helplessness and the isolation was like being buried alive. I retreated into my own private world of memory and imagination. Time was slower than slow, with the usual measures of seconds, minutes, hours, and even days suspended into a blur of frightful sounds and pitiful sights. Ward 4 seemed a human wasteland. It presented a staggering array of crippled bodies and damaged minds. A living picture of pain and madness. The noises on the ward combined to create a truly maddening din. I couldn't escape simply by closing my eyes. What Ruth was doing could hardly be called living. Her physical condition rapidly deteriorated. At one point, she weighed as little as 30 pounds. She saw her family only occasionally. And for three long years, no one at the institution seemed interested in Ruth. Good afternoon, Ruthie. Let's have some lunch. No one, that is, until a new attendant named Wessie made a startling discovery. Okay, During on. lunch one day in early December of 1965, Wessie said something to me like, too bad the food in this place is so lousy. I laughed and raised my eyebrows toward the ceiling in an exaggerated way to draw her attention. Ruthie, look at me, Ruthie. Are you trying to tell me something? Wessie knew she was onto something, but she didn't know what. Ruthie, look at me. Then it clicked. A silent conversation flashed between us as loud and clear as any spoken words. Ruthie, do you understand what I'm saying? I was raising my eyes oh, to say show, yes. Show me yes. While the discovery that Ruth was not an imbecile was dramatic, it sadly didn't change her life much. There was, after all, no place for a 15-year-old handicapped girl like her to go. And since she couldn't speak, most attendants didn't bother with her. In fact, the inhumane treatment raged on. Again, using Ruth's own account, this is how she describes her treatment at the hands of one attendant. She picked me up and dumped me into my chair bed. My right leg clipped one of the big side wheels and was doubled up when I landed. I cried out as I felt something snap just above my knee. Sorry, Ruthie. Ruth's leg was broken. It would take three agonizing days before she was taken to the hospital and treated. It's probably broken. I was a physical and emotional wreck. For the first time in my life, I was totally without hope. If possible, I would have overdosed on pills or slashed my wrist to end the misery. But I couldn't even ask someone to do it for me. I was trapped in a body without a voice, wrapped up in a plastic box, confined to a ward behind brick walls and iron gates. There seemed to be only one way out for me, and that was off the deep end. Oh, it's so good to see you. But Ruth did not go off the deep end. Slowly, the staff began to take notice of the flashing eyes and the exaggerated facial expressions. One day in 1971, a volunteer worker introduced Ruth to a language board. Is this Ruth? A whole new world opened up. How about this? With the other person holding the board in front of me, I selected a particular Great. picture by directing them with my eyes and my yes-no okay. expressions. Good girl. Okay, next, Ruth, I'm going to point to a word that describes how you feel today. Do you understand? Okay, good. Here we go. Do you feel... Yeah, great. Good work. But the real breakthrough would take many more years of struggle. Finally, on June 30th, 1978, 16 years after her parents brought her here, 
Ruth left Belchertown. Today, she lives in this apartment in Northampton, Massachusetts. It's only 20 miles from Belchertown. But it is light years away from her yesterday. And what a different life Ruth leads now. For the last eight years, she's been married to Norman Mercer, a kind and loving man she met at the institution. He lived there for 44 years. Like Ruth, he suffers from cerebral palsy, and he shares many of the same nightmares of their confinement. But they have each other, and they have a life. Though they are dependent on full-time care, theirs is a life lived with dignity, hope, and accomplishments. Using a new, more sophisticated language board, Ruth has just completed a book with co-author Stephen Kaplan. It's titled, I Raise My Eyes to Say Yes. It took them 10 years to write. It's down here. Do you know what you're looking for? <laughs> Ruth's book is aimed towards tomorrow. It carries a simple yet powerful message to the society that once imprisoned her. Look beyond my body. Accept me the way I am. While Ruth is no longer confined by the walls of an institution, she is limited by the boundaries of discrimination. At a wedding shower not long ago, Ruth was asked to finish her meal in another room because some guests complained that watching her eat ruined their appetites. The old prejudices of yesterday still keep her from being a full member of society today. <laughs> The book Ruth wrote with Stephen Kaplan carries another message for tomorrow as well, a message that is unmistakable. You cannot warehouse the disabled, even the severely disabled. Uh, it doesn't do the disabled any good. It doesn't do our society any good. Are you interested in buying a blouse to go with it? A white blouse? Ruth and Norman may be out of the state institution, but they are dependent on government funding which allows them to live at only a subsistence level. It is support which no one here can take for granted and which can change as government policies and priorities change. As long as the stereotypes persist, the idea that disabled people can't contribute to society, that they are incapable of living independent lives, Ruth and Norman's tomorrow remains uncertain. They're only one step away from being forced back into an institutional or a less free setting because if the money gets cut below a certain level, they can't staff, they can't afford the autonomy. And they know that, so there's always an element of fear and underlying their day-to-day their -day lives, what's gonna happen next? Oh, yeah. Norman said repeatedly, he'll never go back to Belchertown, he'll never go back to an institution. No matter what happens. Is that what you meant? He'll kill himself before he does I'll kill myself. I the point so much. Why so good, Norm? Ruth and Norman's plea that we never again hide the severely disabled underscores how vulnerable many of them still feel today. Yet much has changed. Today, even Belchertown is a far more humane place than it was back then. You see, when it comes to the disabled, what was and what is are no longer the same. New attitudes in society, coupled with the disabled's own determination, can bring light into darkness, hope into despair. With people like Ruth to inspire us, we move one step closer to sharing the same dreams for tomorrow. judgment oh now we're all deaf huh <laughs> isn't that true we all pass judgment yeah. and nine times out of ten when you pass a judgment it's a negative concept correct yeah. well I passed a judgment on a very lovely lady about six months ago I was invited to Washington DC to perform at the Kennedy Center for some kind of award presentation when I got there the stage manager asked me to go into the green room and when I went in there he said you need to be quiet in this room because the noise from this room can travel onto the stage. Now, I myself have never seen noise travel. They say this stuff happens, I go along with it. 
I go into the green room, and in the green room is a woman in a wheelchair. She's a quadriplegic. My first judgment I passed upon was, my God, what kind of a life is this? She can't move, she can't talk, she can't walk. She has nothing to contribute to society. But me being who I am, I went up to her and I said, hi, how are you? She started to open her eyes. At first, I was taken back. I said, hi, how are you? Her eyes started to open up really wide. When they got really wide, her assistant came by and she says, when she opens her eyes, it means yes. When she closes her eyes, it means no. I said, great, I spent my whole life learning how to read lips, and I got to go to school for some eyelids over here. <laughs> The woman in the wheelchair started to laugh. It was a horrendous sound. It was a, uh, uh, uh. But to me, it was the most beautiful sound I ever heard. I realized right then and there, I can communicate with her. Now, what better person to tell all your jokes to than somebody who can't heckle you? <laughs> so here you have me and Ruth in the middle of this green room, and all you can hear is this, uh, 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 uh. I'm going, come on, Ruth, let's get some dancing shoes, and let's get out of here. And she's, uh, uh, uh. Stage manager screaming, get the death board away from the quad. <laughs> That night, Ruth received an award. She wrote two top-selling books with a blink of an eye. Today, she has computerized, uh, it's a computer word board where she has a wire attached to her eyelids. She sees the letters she wants, she blinks her eyes, it goes into the computer. Two top-selling books. I haven't even read a book yet. <laughs> I graduated from high school with a one-point average. Nobody bothered to tell me we were collecting points. <laughs> that night, after the show, Ruth had a computer print out for me, and it sat on it. Thank you so much for making me laugh. But more than anything else, thank you for treating me like you would have treated anyone else. I took that piece of paper, I wrote on the back of it, and I handed it to her. I said, there, that's my bill. <laughs> <laughs> Around the corner, thank you. Around the corner comes a gentleman in a wheelchair. He has cerebral parsley. He has no front teeth. Me being who I am, where the heck are your teeth? The man starts to laugh. Uh, uh. It's her husband. <laughs> She's married. I couldn't believe it. I looked her straight in the eye and I said, you know what, Ruth? I came in here tonight and I thought to myself, my God, what kind of a life is this? Only because I didn't think I could live it if I was in your situation. Here you wrote two top-selling books. I can't read. You're married. I can't even get a date. <laughs> I said, I hope you get pink eyes. <laughs> <laughs> The moral of the story is, please, don't pass judgment upon someone you wouldn't want passed upon yourselves. Because believe me when I tell you, there are no limits as to what you can possibly do with your lives. Have a good night, and God bless. Thank you so much.